Good evening and welcome once again to the Santa Podcast, your Friday night fix of uh, European drag racing and a home of the Santa Pod Raceway. Yes, of course, we cannot wait to get back up there. Luke and I are going to be chatting to two great guests this evening, but first of all, got to check in with our buddy, but it looks like he's hiding there. Luke, are you all right, mate? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm brilliant, Colin, oh. but guess what? I'm ready to get back on track at our back on track days. I'm so excited after last Friday's announcement that we are going to go back to racing at Santa Pod Raceway. I just can't wait. The, the original, we started doing this when lockdown was on and no one had anything to do. So I'm just looking forward to seeing everyone's faces back at Santa Pod and to smell some race fuel. Oh, you are so, so right there. I can't wait to see two days of on-track action, you know, 100 cars uh, per event. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. Um, just to hear a race engine doing a you know, just seeing the cars doing burnouts, getting up that quarter mile, we honestly, we cannot wait. So many people are so eager, not only to be at the track, but also just watch something from Sample Raceway uh, because the events, uh, they will be live streamed as well. So we cannot wait. Really, really excited. Not to mention after this week, seeing yourself as a lady, I think you need one of these masks. And I'm pretty sure Keith would like to see me without a mask because I was looking fit as a woman. What do you think, Keith? I think both of you as a woman, no, doesn't cut it, but in a mask, that's very encouraging. The reason <coughs> being, I don't care about the mask, it's what the message is. You're right, we're going back racing, and like yourself, I, I just can't possibly wait. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's um, protesting, there's going to be run what you brungs, and uh, I have a sneaking suspicion the way the government are relaxing and changing regulations at the moment, I can actually see August, probably all late August, September, actually some level of events being held with spectators. I can see that coming. Getting back to events, Keith, I think you're absolutely right. Can't wait. Really can't yeah. wait. Yeah, we've, we've had a very busy last 10 days, two weeks, getting things set up to meet the current regulations for, for social distancing and, and good health practices to, to meet all the uh, health and safety requirements. So... An awful lot of work's gone into just getting the track ready, just getting the facility ready. It's not the track, although we've got a lovely sunny week this week and I know the guys will be out prepping the track and getting ready. And that's going to be a, a great feeling just to see everyone out prepping the track. Yeah, very, very encouraging indeed. And I know a lot of people that really can't wait to get up there. They're totally happy to pay the prices uh, that have been advertised because they just want to get back on track. They want to support Sandford Raceway. They want to support the facility. And of course, support drag racing in general. Luke, um, I tell you what, mate, I'm desperate to get up there myself. I know you are as well. Bring it on. That's all I can say. Yeah, get me in that tower, lock the door. No one come and see me, please, because I am still socially distancing. But it's going to be good fun. So it is Friday night. We have got two cracking guests <laughs> on the show. I may not know everything about them, but I know Keith will. Keith, what are you got to say about our guests this evening? Yeah, I'm looking forward very much to our guests this evening. I know both of them very well. In the case of one of them, it goes back a little bit further than the other one, but there's not much between it. Um, they're guys that I've got a lot of respect for, a lot of time for. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking to them both. I'm so hoping there's some old school photos of you and Gary wearing flares. Um, there definitely are such photographs around, I can assure you. They're definitely, and even worse than that, particularly with the two cars behind you, Henry High Rise and Roaring Rat, when we put those in the custom car shows and won them, we did really well with Roaring Rat. I look at the pictures of us at the show and look at the way I'm dressed and it's, I'm aghast. <laughs> <laughs> well, we look forward to seeing all those photographs appear. That's going to be a part of the show without a shadow of a doubt, as you say, with these two guys that have got a huge amount of people in Sanford Raceway. So, Luke, I think it's time we better introduce our guests, don't you reckon? Go for it. Right. First up, a man that has been driving pretty much everything down that quarter mile over a huge period of time. So as you say, as Keith was saying, since the 1970s, he's driven pro comp cars, altered, top fuel cars, funny cars, and tow trucks as well, because he's part of the Runefield Motorsports stable at the moment. And basically, a guy that I've known for over 30 years. Yeah, I knew this man before I even started right, coming up Santa Pod as a regular. Gary Page, a very, very good evening to you. Great to have you on the show. And honestly, mate, it's, it's absolutely an honour to be able to have you on the show tonight, it really is. Yeah, evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, it was uh, it was a real nice surprise when Keith uh, 
you know, rang up and said, you know, would I like to appear on it? Um, I've been watching all the other ones and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's been a really good idea. It just keeps everyone up to speed and uh, it's been really good, been really enjoyable. Brilliant stuff. Well, we look forward to digging deeper into your history yep. and uh, going through some of your races, etc., etc. Now, it looks, it actually looks like you've got a twin brother on the show tonight. Um, as the, where are you both wearing your black T-shirt? He's the uglier one. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in, the, in the other corner, uh, we've got the gladiator himself. Now then, this guy has been basically born and bred Santa Pod Raceway. I can't think of anywhere else on this planet he would rather be. His, his company, FGR Motorsport, is literally just outside the gates on Airfield Road. Every car that goes up the track is either driven it or he's heard it. And I can't think of anything else to say apart from great to have you on the show, Jason Phelps. How are you doing, mate? I'm very good, thank you. I'm glad I'm 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 glad I got asked, but for different reasons to uh, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> More of that later. Yeah, 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 yeah. We'll deal with that in a bit. Yeah, no, it's it's great. I, I think it's obviously a good thing, keeps the interest going, and um, yeah. Looking forward to get all getting back and being a little bit more normal. That's basically where I'm at right now. Now then, before we go any further, I think Keith, you have got to ask the first question tonight. Who are you going to pick on, and what's your question? Uh, well, I'm going to talk to both of them first. I mean, they both they both both of them have driven funny cars. Jason only <laughs> driven funny cars. Gary drove Alters, better known with everyone for his funny cars. Well, really, the Page family, but. It seems that if you're going to drive a funny car, you've got to kind of have a shaved head. Steve Ashdown, Kevin Kent, now Jason seems to have shaved his head, which I'm not sure if that's to be a funny car driver or to get ready for this show. I, I suspect <laughs> it's the second. You know, everywhere you look, apart from Kevin Chapman, funny car drivers seem to have had shaved head. I'd like to uh, start with Jason because a few weeks ago on our show, that young Frankie Fordham... Uh, made a bit of a statement that when we asked him what he would like to do in the future, he said, well, my, my dream would be to drive a fuel funny car. But uh, somewhere along that interview, there was a very short little fox pop, fox pop where he sort of went, uh, yeah, well, Jason Phelps only goes 60 foot. You look at Jason Phelps, he only does 60 foot. So, uh... oh, <laughs> that happened to go in the trailer, which I know kind of pissed you off a bit, putting it bluntly. So I'm dying to hear what you think of Frankie Fordham saying, Jason Phelps only goes 60 foot. Well, maybe I'm being a bit precious, right? But after I worked out by looking him up on Facebook, whether he was a girl or a boy, um, <laughs> I, I, my initial thought was maybe I should phone him and offer him a drive in the funny car. But um, it would have been a, a trouble getting it past Jackie, to be honest with you, because uh, Jackie, Jackie mothers his, her drivers, don't she, Gary? She's oh, a, yeah. she's a, oh god yeah, she, yeah. she's that she's an absolute she's an absolute mother to anyone that's in the car and uh, yeah I am uh, yeah I can be a little bit way but uh, I I'm not a problem to Frankie at all I think he's lovely I think he should have a go at a funny car if he ever works out which funny car and how he's going to go down that route that would be a fantastic thing I would definitely buy a ticket no actually I won't buy a ticket I'll come in I'll just come in and watch it. And what do you and how do you think you know what what would your reaction be if he only went sixty foot? We all know we all know the cars reach sixty foot in before you can blink. But you know he said Jason Phelps only goes to sixty foot. I uh, he's driven a junior dragster. Two of my daughters drive junior dragsters. Funny car will probably be going through the traps and the junior dragster gets like two hundred feet. So you know it's uh, it is a case of pull your pants in one of those cars. Funny cars are just fucking awesome. Basically, and, and when you stand on the gas, it's like an explosion of madness. So why wouldn't anyone? I, I used to lay in bed, five years old, dreaming about driving Gladiator Funny Car. And I feel blessed that I got the chance. We've had a bit of a rough time with it over the last two years. I do have a history before the uh, Gladiator Funny Car in Shockwave and stuff like that. But obviously, Frankie, the boy, he's um, not old enough to actually remember when I used to go further than the 60s. But... But hey, maybe in, hopefully when we all get back to this, we'll have another dig at it. And uh, I'm not, I've got, I've got an entire team behind me. And when, when someone sort of says, uh, oh, the car don't do this or the car don't do that. I always remember the first time I drove funny car and I was in a uh, custom car and it, it was like my first little write up. And it said, uh, and it was a November meeting and the car had gone off up on its tyres twice. Right? And it said, Jason Phelps uh, couldn't find any traction. 
And I thought, it's got nothing to do with me. You need to go and speak to Dave Bryant <laughs> because, because the, the whole thing is an operation. And so, like, the driver is just one little small part of it. And literally, without any of the others, nothing happens. Nothing happens. Nothing whatsoever. Do you know what? Do you know what, Jace? You've just jogged my memory. I mentioned it earlier in the show that all funny car drivers got shaven heads. I forgot. Some crew chief, you know, Dave Bryant's also got his head shaved. It's a worry thing. Everyone in Fuel Funny Car is grey. That's what, we're all older and we're all going grey. I've got grey hair, so I just don't well, that, both both accounts. Let's Frankie Fordham out. Then he's young. He's got a lot of hair and uh, he's not going grey. He's a sponsor's dream. There you go. <laughs> 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 he's, he's a sponsor's dream. Just like uh, we're not anymore. There you go. We're just old blokes. Yeah, we're just old. Just stand on them and go. Sing I know. I know. Yeah. Before I that, hand back. Before I hand back to the guys in the studios, um, something I'm going to kind of ask both of you, because we're always discussing it. J Jason's totally involved. Gary's looking from another side now. But where do you see Fuel Funny Cars going? We were in a very promising position this year. We had five funny cars coming out to run the series this year. First time for quite a few years. These guys are guys that born to be funny car drivers. I hate the, hate the phrase, but it's quite true. And by and large, usually kind, kind of street racer mentality, you know, not necessarily a big sponsorship. You know, it's a street racer mentality. This is my car. I'll build it and I'll race it. How do you see the funny cars going? Bearing in mind, it's unlikely that that level of guy brings in a lot of sponsorship. Uh, you know, uh, obviously, I love the funny car class. You know, that's... Uh... Out of, out of everything, you know, the dragster's really good. You know, I've enjoyed driving the dragster. That was a lot of fun. Um, but, you know, if it was like you got two choices, there's no choice. It would always be the funny car. You've kept, you've kept the cars going, Keith. You know, you, you've stayed with it. And there could have been times when you've said, look, you know, I don't want you to run. Because the cars have struggled, you know. And, and it is, you know, I try and watch the cars every every time they run, you know, because there's nothing better than seeing, a, you know, a full pass from the funny cars. And, yeah, they are difficult and, you know, they are temperamental. And, you know, the cars haven't always run up to their potential, but they've all kept at it. You know, they've all kept going and they all want to run quick and stuff. And the crowds love them. And there's more cars coming out, which is only a good thing for the class. You know, more people are you know, want to get involved with it. And, you know, they're putting their money where their mouth is because it, it's a shed load of money. So, I mean, I know when Liam first started driving the dragster, he looked at, he said, I'll buy one. And then when he looked at it, you know, garage, trailer, truck, tools, spares, he went, ah, maybe I'll just keep renting one. Because it is, you, you're going to be into it for half a million pounds. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it's not many people have got that sort of spare cash. And, it, you know, the return on it, or well, they get prize money, the return on it basically will cover the cost, hopefully, for the weekend. And it often doesn't cover the cost of the weekend. It's just no. Who knows. You know, the prize money they can earn, even though the actual prize money is good with Fuel Funny Car, the truth is, unless they go right the way through to make all their runs for the weekend, you know, the prize money will just barely cover the cost of the runs. What what you've got to take into account with the funny cars as it is at the moment, and I know it's the it's like a constant track time. We don't get enough time. We I'm, at the moment we've got a, a, a new funny car with a new setup, and we're trying. And we, uh, it's been two seasons now. Well, not quite two seasons, but two seasons. But that only really I've had, I think I've actually been in the car let's say twelve, fifteen times. Uh, you are just constantly struggling against that. Then on top of that, the fact that every time you stand on the uh, gas, it's going to cost you 1,500 quid. And that's if you don't really hurt anything. Consumable. Yeah. Consumable, you're looking at 450 quid in the clutch, probably 500 quid's worth of fuel, the oil's 200 quid. It's ridiculous. I, and always, then I always work, Jason, on, on a fuel car. You won't run it much under about three grand for a normal run without any damage. If you, if you, if you, if you factor in anything, but to be honest, if you, if you 
have ever been involved in running a uh, funny car and you factor in everything, you'd go mental. So why you why don't even bother with timing stuff out or saying I've had that many runs, it's like 250 quid on the tires. You've probably got 10 runs on the tires, they're two and a half grand. So it's 250 quid every time you think you send the thing down the racetrack. But in all honesty, the only reason I'm still here and at it is Mark Hawkins. That man has put for <laughs> has put basically he, he, it's one of the most tenacious, incredible stories that's actually happened over the course of time. He, he built a car, got it to the point where it was going to be on a racetrack, then the chassis got outlawed, and he had to send it back to America, buy another car. He got, and he gets the thing to the track. I tell you, when you've got the people like that, the reason our car is so pretty is because it's got no sponsors on it. I've got a few sponsors. Lucas is very good to us. They help us really well, and it, it takes on quite a big worry out of our way. But if it wasn't for the uh, Jackie and Mark, you, you said, we're saying the class is building. Um, it's down to two people, them two people, that you've got one other car. And if it wasn't for their enthusiasm, they've been at the track since the uh, mid, late, early, late 70s. And if it wasn't for that volunteer, complete enthusiasm for the sport, then you wouldn't have five funny cars, you'd have four. And, without, and that just runs through the whole of drag racing. And, Where do you see funny car class going? It does run through drag race. You're quite right what you say, Jason. Bear in mind, we've yet to see the impact of the lockdown and unemployment. If you take funny car and pro mod, there are two classes that it's usually owner drivers, generally, and the yeah. guys are putting the money in out their own businesses. So I sincerely hope there's going to be enough money around for these cars to continue to expand and develop. It's, it's going to, I, I think, all of us are old enough to remember the recessions before and i think we're just about to come into recessions to end all recessions really and but the tenacity of people and drag racers in general will keep them going to the racetrack you know we've really had to push it to get to different but there's plenty of times where we shouldn't have been there and said do you know what this is gonna this is not good for us but we'll always be there and that i think the just the general will of the drag racers and the and the will behind Santa Pod Raceway will push it through. Your problem when you open up the gates isn't going to be getting people to come. It's going to be too many people coming. They'll be queued past Rushton or Wollaston to try and get in there. And that. I've got to stop you there. I've got to stop and say that will not be a problem. Queues. <laughs> yeah. Problem. In lockdown, I, I absolutely hate having to go and queue in any shops. And if I look back over the last twenty five years. I'm not a great queuer. I expect to go in and get served immediately and a uh, bit of arrogance there. But the one queue I absolutely adore, queuing to come into Santa Pod in the morning, it's, it's quarter to nine and the queue goes back past the uh, Williston roundabout. There's never, you've never seen a happier man than Keith Bartlett. You're, uh, you're, preaching, you're preaching to the converted. I'm a Phelps and that queue... We used to feel exactly the same about yeah. Let, let me just come back on something you said, Jason. You mentioned the claustrophobia. As you know, Suzanne, my wife came back into fuel racing last year with 14 years out from having kids. Jason knows I wanted to put her in a funny car because we needed funny cars. Her sole reason for not going in a funny car is she could not take the claustrophobic the feeling team. there is We're when that hood goes down. As... Uh, you know, we were talking to Frank Hawley once, and obviously they run the drag racing school. He said he was he had one guy uh, doing the alcohol funny car class, and in the classroom he was, you know, did everything. You know, general, he was really good. Got him out on the track. You know, started the car up, put the body down. He said, I walked off, waved him up to the water box. Car stayed there. Lifted the body up, and they said, what's wrong? Well, you know, what? He said, I can't do it. He said, I can't do it. He said, he got out. He had to go and get his wife, he said, because he's not very good with blokes crying. He said, I'm all right with girls. He said, but the bloke just broke down. He said, when you put the body down, he said, that was it. He said, I was petrified. Until yeah. you're in there he and they drop that body car, down, you have no the whole car feeling of what it's actually place. like. And, wheel. you know, it, it, it's a, I think you're braver to say you can't do it than try and do it because you'll hurt yourself. Yeah, I agree with that. Believe it or not, Jason, this is way back in the 70s. I thought I would love to run the known Santa Pod. Uh, Dreamer. <laughs> my, my second dream, actually, <laughs> my second dream was also like I'm crazy about funny cars. And I remember when we had slick tricks in my office, there was just pictures of funny cars everywhere. Stardust, which fortunately I, I now own. 
I used to have Gary Bergen's car, Pruder Holmes, they were all in there, uh, as well as the English guys, so, and including you, Gary. <laughs> and, and I was crazy about funny car, but you know what? I never had the natural feel to drive a funny car that Norm Wilding had. And that's the thing. I think you need that natural feel and you're a natural. And if you're not a natural, you might uh, get over it. You might learn it. You might be able to manage it, but you'll never be a top driver. Funny cars breed a certain type of driver. That's a fact of life. I don't you have to have less brain cells. Yeah, less brain cells, yeah. And in most cases, <laughs> you have to shave your head. Well, yeah, obviously, yeah. That. That's so your helmet comes off easy. <laughs> well, let's not talk about that, please, Gary. Yeah. Please, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is a family show. Yeah, a family show, yeah. Um, but, but seriously, I, I'm just not prepared to shave my head. And for that reason, I'm never going to funny car. <laughs> yeah, it'll never happen. It'll never no. happen. Um, guys, I'm going to... I've watched our two guys in the studio listening to this. I'm sure they've got a few things they'd like to ask you both. And uh, don't yeah. worry, I'll be uh, back. Jason, going to kick one off straight over to you. Um, let's just rewind the clock back. Only two years, Auto Sports Show, you gave me this. Oh, do you see what I mean? I do modelling as well. Oh, Airfix. <laughs> right, we've said better looking drivers, but good looking funny cars. I tell you what, that is a home run. What do you yeah. reckon of that, mate? Uh, while I'm on air, I'd like to know why I didn't get on the shortlist for best appearing car. There you go. I yeah. knew he was going to say something like that. I just absolutely knew it. But I... well, 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 ridiculous. How could you produ- <laughs> how could you produce that right? And then no. Oh, oh. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. Next time, I'm just going to paint it matte black. I'll let Emily paint it, colour it. There you go. Do that. I'll tell you what, Jace. I'll make a deal with you. The day oh. you go past 60 foot, I'll make sure oh. you pass the bill. <laughs> oh, you know, if you didn't own this track, I wouldn't talk to you. I'll stick, I'll stick me or in. Uh, yeah, I mean, that funny car looks amazing. Absolutely amazing. You know, it, it's yeah. such a, it's, you know, Iconic. it's the original Gladiator, but a real modern twist on it. And it's, oh. when I saw it, it was so cool. Oh, so no, cool. I've got to support that, Gary. Jace, in all yeah. seriousness, uh, it, it's got a lot of meaning. For me, it was a great paint job, but what it stood for was just fantastic. And I know oh, that yeah. you did it, and it's uh, very, very special. Being serious now. Yeah, all right, you've got to give credit. Darren West, uh, Klaus, uh, Russian Graphics. Um, who else was there? There was uh, there's Dominic that actually applied the paint. So they're probably, there's actually about five people involved in the whole deal. Well, even my tattooist, he designed the, um, the Gladiator on the side. I got him to draw that. Then that became a joy. And it was like five people. And when and it's one well, you're playing with a piece of history and they went with it and and it's produced that. You know we've got a new body as well. You know we've got yeah, a new no, body. Yeah. yeah, we're gonna, yeah. Now you wanna see bling, that's gonna be bling like you've never I'll tell you what, it's gonna be walking into a oh. I was just thinking, obviously, you're talking about uh Jason modeling there. Gary, I've seen some photos. You're not modeling, but you Jesus. Do a rather fine looking model with your old panic funny car of Sylvie Hauser. Yeah. 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 I mean, you know, they were all, uh, you know, those magazines and stuff and all these things, you know, I've got a few of them behind me and custom car was the, you know, the magazine to be in and stuff then. And when we got inducted into the hall of fame and they did the thing about the page family, I sat down and read it and I'd forgotten so much of it because we've been lucky enough to do so much and then when you go over it, it brings back so many memories. Mark, one of the questions I want to ask, because I've been around racing since like the 80s, but mainly since the 90s. So yeah. there's a lot of stuff that I don't know. And I'd love to find out uh, the panic name that you have on nearly every car, be it an altered or a funny car. Yeah. What, what does that represent? And why has why it been with the family for so long? <sighs> you know, I mean, when we um, when we first started off, you know, we were looking about for names and then, you know, we, we stole it. You know, everyone knows that Panic was in America and we just looked at it and we thought, bloody hell, you're going to yourself when you get in one, so you're going to panic. So we thought, we're going to, you know, so we stole the name from the American Fuel Lord and, you know, it, it becomes synonymous with the family and, you know, and it's stuck ever since and it's it's just such a good name. It evokes such incredible memories. And, of course, you know, some people always remember that you're not just a fuel funny car driver, you're not such a crew guy but you're also an auto driver as well. And so you've driven some pretty badass vehicles over the years. He's crashed a few as well. Yeah, crashed a few. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you've, yeah. Never, you've, only, you've only ever hit chaos though, isn't it? 
Uh, yeah, I only crashed. I mean, I did clip the fence again with with panic. You we started off in... about fifteen of them, but you've oh, only God, actually yeah, 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 hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah you've yeah. only actually no. hit. Yeah. <laughs> First time at the pod, it just shook so bad. Yes, unbelievable. And then the same, you know, when when it crashed, the, when we crashed at Avon Park with it, it shook so bad it snapped all the fireballs, which decided to spray under the tyres, which ain't too Gary, clever. Gary crashed my car. The car I built, kept... Gary crashed. And then, do you know but what? Jason, I've kept, kept you in business. You know Bloody hell. Let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. <laughs> so we turns up at Avon Park, right? And we did, the car had run really well at Easter or something, weren't it? And it was like started yeah. off, it was brand spanking you. It started off at yeah. 680 and it just got yeah. quicker and quicker. Five runs, boom, boom, boom. He's like yeah. master class of driving. All is running perfectly. We go over to um, Avon Park. It's our first time over. So then I turn mm. around to Gary. I said, right, listen, Gary, we've, you know, we've not been, I've not really been here before running this. I said, Gary, anything unusual happens. I said, just get out of it. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. Comes off the line. Wow, it's shaking its nuts off, wasn't it? It was just mental. It all goes to chaos, and then pirouettes in the track, rolls, I was a burst into flame. I look at Laurie Gatehouse, he looked like, honestly, he looked like a ghost, right? We get up there, God bless Gary, he's fine, it's all cool, it's all part of the story, but excellent. He comes up to me about 20 minutes later, he went, there was some white stuff on me, crash helmet. And I went, what do you mean? He said, I don't know. He said, there was this white stuff. I said, Gary, I'm not seeing anything unusual. <laughs> I was kind of talking about things like uh, white stuff. And uh, basically what happened uh, is it had shaken so bad, the fireballs fell off. Old Leadfoot here stayed with it. And uh, yeah, yeah. You know, so he's the only person that's actually crashed one of my cars. All the others just go straight to the side. Thanks, guys. <laughs> well, as I said, you know, you said you, said you didn't have much different. work on. So I just thought I'd help you out. <laughs> to be but honest, it did uh, help out. I looked down at the firewall and I saw all this white fluid coming up and I thought, it was like after the crash and I thought, what's that? And then yeah, I, well, I went around the back and saw the fire bolts like, on the track and then I worked out and that's, it just snapped. It's just one of them things, you know. It, it's uh, At least this time they didn't cut me fire suit off. Harry, uh, <laughs> yeah. I did bring up earlier about fires and that, but seriously, do you want to, for those people who don't understand it at home, do you want to just count through the emotions and the physical things you have to do when you get a reasonably serious fire. Yeah, the big one obviously was uh, when I drove Canute's car, and uh, no surprises there. Most people had a fire. In well, you know, and uh, we planned on doing yeah, just a half pass in that car, uh, which I did. But as soon as I left it off the throttle, and then you know, you it was fine, and then all of a sudden you hear, Woof, and you think, oh, and then I saw the flames, and I thought, oh, okay, it's not too bad, and then it just just erupted so all you can do and then instantly it's this is before it was mandatory that you had to have an air system on your crash helmet and i, I do believe that's one of the best things they bought in because I agree. Um, all you do is you know you go through this in your mind or you know when people say what do you do with the fire you know when i used to sit in the car even in the pit so i used to sit in there you know, used to go through everything with the body down, with the suit on and everything. And just, you know, blindfold test yourself. And they do a blindfold test, you know, when when they come around to check you can get out the car and all this stuff. And they, they put a blindfold around you, or they did. And you have to, you know, go where the fire bottles is, handbrake, fuel levers, parachutes. And, and that's what it's like because when it catches fire, you know, you can't see anything. It's just like somebody sticking black tape over your crash helmet. You try and think well the car was going straight but it's so difficult because you have no idea where you are and uh it said the worst thing about it you know apart from burning the car to the ground and stuff was i had a cough for about six months after that it was just awful and my well, i've still got the crash you. helmet i've still got the crash helmet and it still stinks of smoke oh yeah well, if, it, if it, you've got no quality of air in there so like in in a in a, in a good run the car changes colour three times on its way down there. You hit the throttle, blow the clutch dust. Yeah. And about they're about half track. The clutch, the clutch starts to come in. You get that spiral coming up out yeah. of the um, out of yeah. the uh, uh, bell house, and then all of a sudden, going up the top, and it turns yellow. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I, you know I, I presume it's nitro, but I've never really asked. And it all mm. sort of goes yellow and all, and it does this. 
the actual quality of the air, what Gary's saying about the air system in the crash helmet, if you, on occasions, if you're different occasions where it bogs up and stuff like that, it, mm -hmm. it like, because what it will do is keep you clean, uh, your visor clean. But if it does fog up, they, and you've lifted your visor for anything, they, even on a good run, it's not good in there. Well, you come out covered in clutch dust and, yeah. you know, said I was, when I come out of the car, you know, with all the smoke, and, you know, all the fiberglass and stuff burning and everything, it, it was just, you know, I was absolutely black. My face was black and, you know, and, and said that was the worst thing. I just had this poxy cough, which I could not get rid of. And it was yeah. just breathing in, you know, breathing in smoke and just all the, you know, chemicals and stuff. And, you know, it, it, it's, they're dangerous. You know, it's like sitting in the middle of a barbecue. You know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't think, oh, this is a good idea. I think, I think what everyone... people need to remember quite clearly with uh, these type of cars that, they are extreme machines to the absolute level. I mean, Gary, uh, I hate to sort of take you back, but 1986, Tony Bowden uh, in oh, yeah. time, um, it can go horribly wrong. It really can go horribly wrong. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just I amazing. mean, that was terrible. You know, I was, uh, I was engaged to Tracy at the time and uh, the accident actually happened on my birthday. Um, we were going to go out to Hockenheim and then for some reason we didn't. And then obviously, um, you know, we got the phone call and uh, we, uh, I'm not being dramatic here, but it, uh, it sort of chokes me up. You know, I was thinking about whether you'd speak about this and uh, we, we went out to Hockenheim the following week, uh, following Thursday, but he was in the hospital. I can't remember the one that uh, Nicky Lauder was taken to when he had his really bad crash. And um, we, uh, we were taken in to see him. Sue was there and uh, we, uh, they took us into this uh, corridor on the Friday afternoon when we got there and we couldn't go in the room because he was so badly, you know, badly burnt. And uh, she's, you know, we walked around this corridor and uh, they, we sort of walked past this room and they went, Oh, this is Tony. And it was just, uh, it was, it was rough. You know, it was, uh, fire does you know terrible things and uh it was you know but anyway you know and then the next day uh we were going to go and see him and uh mark animal were, and a few of the other guys were out there they come to pick the car up and uh they wouldn't let us in to see him and um, they said oh they were doing some things and stuff and and all this and then like about an hour later they said that tony had like passed away and uh it was like we rang Mark and literally they'd left the track about 10 minutes before. And it was like, I'm not, yeah, I'm not a big one for all this, but it was like Tony knew the car was going and he, you know, he passed away literally the same time as they left to bring the car home. Yeah. And that was, uh, that, uh, yeah, it, it's a memory I'll always have. And, it's you know they can go really seriously wrong and it was uh, it was yeah it it wasn't good it was bad. I do I do remember yeah. it was a tough time, Gary, because if you remember, you know, we both lived in Big Cot at the time. Yeah. And um, I think I took Tracy down to the family home in Somerset and uh, yeah. sort a few things out and uh, yeah, it was uh, it was it was a tough period and it was of course the fact yeah. that when I really just started to get to know you. We remember we bumped into the pub in Big Cot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. those years ago and uh, you know I sort of. So I think I had a like a Tom Hoover T-shirt on, and yeah, yeah. Uh, you're at the bar uh, with Tracy, and you you just said something to me. So oh, nice T-shirt, mate. And I sort of talk about Drake. Yeah. Oh, you want to get involved? It's great. It's great. Great. Yeah, yeah. And then you yeah, let yeah. on Gary Page, um, and then that led to plenty of evenings going around and watching Diamond P videos in your flat in Big Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. years ago, Gary. And now he spends all his time around Nick Williams doing the same thing. I know. I mean, <laughs> just sort of quickly. I mean. Can I, can I just add there, Gary, that you both mentioned it. I, I'd like to make clear for everyone at home, safety in funny cars has come a long way in the last 20 years. If you go back to the States in the 70s, explosions, uh, fires, people, a lot of drivers got killed in the late 60s and early 70s. Gary's right what he's saying, but it's, it's a testament to how far we've come on the safety that in America especially, most fires now don't result in any burns. And I... No. I, pride, I pride myself that of all the European tracks, and I think most of the drivers will say this, if you're going to catch fire, catch fire at Santa Pod. I think our 
safety cruiser, second to none. It's been proven time and time again. And when I look back to when uh, Leander's Hasselstrom died in Pythia all those years ago, that was a fire. Leander's was idolised in Swedish drag race and he was seen as God who could do nothing wrong. Totally overweight, couldn't get out of the hatch, escape hatch. Uh, had a really bad fire, couldn't get out. There are more things I can add, add to that which supposedly happened. But the bottom line, there was a fatality. He died. Oh, yeah. And from that, Swedish drag racing didn't really allow funny cars to drive anymore. So there, no. quite a Swedish reaction to things. Oh, dear, this is very dangerous. Let's stop it. But, but what every other country's tried to do is they've actually improved safety. And a lot of the safety that's been introduced is why we're not getting any serious injuries today. Oh, yeah. Can I, can I say, I was actually working with Tony that weekend and uh, it put a scar on me, like, like the same as Harry. We had a real nasty period in 86. There was Mark, we lost uh, Tony, Mark Woodley, then we lost yeah. Tony, then we lost Anders Asselstrom. Um, and then, of course, we had the disgusting accident of uh, Daryl Gwynn. Yeah. I have to say, people don't really understand this about me. Uh, Andy Carter said to me once, when I came back, because I've been away for uh, 12 years or whatever it was since I've been away from the track. Yeah, what what, what did you go down for, Jase? What was it? It wasn't robbery, was it? What did you go down for? <laughs> uh, voyeurism. <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> yeah, that's what can I say. I'm over it now. The... Um, uh, yeah. When I came back to the sport and through, and basically, actually, Gary was the one because I went over to Hockenheim. Ronnie had asked me to drive the wheel stander. Uh, I went over to Hockenheim. I bumped into Gary. Gary said it was just before the finals and he said, Why don't you come and have a drink with us on Friday night? There I met Dave and Gordon. The following day, they crashed the funny car. I can weld. That's how come I'm back in the sport. The, um, um, Try not to hold it against me, Jason. Oh God, Gary! I swear <laughs> to God. The, uh, but what I would, what I would say, right, which is really important to me, I if I hadn't seen um, the vast steps forwards in safety, I would never have gone near the place again. I lost love for the sport because it was hurting too many people. I think I've said to you in the past, Kate, um, the 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 walls at the track has been the biggest safety improvement ever. I think if I think oh, if yeah. had, I think if Dad had turned round in like 1983 and said, I'll tell you what we're gonna do, get rid of all the arm go, we'll put concrete walls up, I think we would have been called we're trying to kill people, everyone. It has got to be one of the safest tracks on the planet. Forget yeah. Europe. Yes, our walls are higher than any other racetrack now. It, I, I tell you what, if you want to go drag racing and uh, negate the risks as much as possible. I, I, I look at Santa Claus right and now, and Andy Carter once said to me, he went, oh, he, when I first came back, and he went, oh, I bet you wish your man had sold this. And I went, you couldn't be more wrong, mate. I said, this wasn't for us. This, this, this is not something that we could have produced to this like this. We were, we, basically, we were a hard-working, enthusiastic family, and the old man loved funny cars. You would have loads of funny cars, that's what, but you'd still be pissing in a hole in the field. That's what would be going on. But when you, when you, when you put those barriers up <laughs> and the actual facility that you've got, right, to actually run the cars, on, I think, uh, honestly, I think, uh, you know, I, I've got to take that off to you. And even my dad would, if I, you know, maybe. You prodded him. <laughs> uh, I mean, Gary, Gary, thank you for that. But just, you know, thank you for all the adulation. But let me be clear. It's on not what... adulation. It's just I'm well not, done. All right? Blowing smoke up his ass, call it kid adulation. Kid I'm crazy. not shaving my hair, Gary. <laughs> Jason Gary, I will not shave it no matter what. No, okay, um, well, that's I, fair enough. Back to a serious note, Jason, and we'll come on to about your family because I want to bring that up with you because uh, I, I, I've got views which you know I share with you about the, the great the great standing that the Felt family must stay in because without them wouldn't be Santa Pop. But we'll touch on that in a moment. What I did want to say is I, I've never been able to cope in all I go to the States a lot to the races. You know I, I know most of the NHRA management very well, especially the new management team <laughs> now. And the one person I've always thought been embarrassed when I meet him is Daryl Gwynn. I shouldn't be, but I just feel anyone I know, I know what you mean. I own Santa Pod. He got he was probably the most top up-and-coming fuel driver at the time. He and he was great with it. 
It was great talking to him, but I'm sure like you and your father, do you know what? Something turns over in my stomach. I, I now own Santa Pod and Daryl was paralyzed and lost his whole racing career. I'm not responsible, but like you and your dad, there is just a little element inside of you goes, God, I am responsible. We're not, but you can't shake it off. He was a, he was such a nice bloke. How old was he? Like twenty nine or something. Twenty eight or twenty seven. He was he was honestly he was the most accommodating. There wasn't anyone else rather than Beagle that was any nicer than you know what I mean. And he was just. Yeah. Let, let, let me come back on that. Let me just come back on something that you mentioned earlier. You said that you know I joked about adulation, but of course I, I know you respect what it was an adulation. No, I know that. <laughs> Listen, I don't... He just wants to make sure you know that, Keith. Yeah, I just want that down on the record. Listen, <laughs> you've got any adulation from me when you've not been talking to me in a strange way for the last five years. <laughs> but but on oh. the track, guys, seriously, when Barry Sheebles, Mickey Kogarad had those bad rollovers, I think it was in 97, uh, on the track, one on Saturday, one on Sunday, and then on the qualifying... Uh, Lena Nystrom flipped her pro stock car straight through the arm code and into the bank. I actually, we talk about the emotion when those three crashes happened and I, you know, I usually go to the end. I let the emergency crew do their own. I, I actually stood there crying. I was crying because I was scared they were going to die, all three of them. I was crying because I felt I could have been responsible. And I swore to myself after that meeting, I will put all the barriers in and safety will take the prime thing. And we then went concrete barriers, both sides, all the way down. So out of the knowledge, we have got to have safety ahead of performance. And I like to think we've continued that at Santa Pod ever since. We even widened the finish line gantry just so that the, the uprights weren't next to the guardrail where someone could go and kill themselves in it. And, uh, I feel that I feel a lot more um, happy, a lot more satisfied, and a lot more confident now that if cars go down, we've done all we possibly can to prevent accidents. And even when Graham Ellis had that terrible crash and flipped the barrier, you know, and he did get injured, but he was all right. Andy Robinson, just a couple of years ago, which we showed on show our show number two, you know, these crashes, uh, every one of them will tell you that those barriers contain it. And, uh, uh, I mean, See, that's that's the thing, Keith. It's when when you say accident, it is an accident. It's like, you know, if you spill a cup of tea, it's an accident. You yeah, don't deliberately do it. And it, it's, you know, we all know the risk and the, the cars run so fast and they're they're also, you know, on the edge. Yeah, anyone can crash at any time, you know, and they're taking that aspect out. You know, you've got titanium, you know, shields on the roll cage. Now, as I just said, you know, you've got air systems in the funny car you've got the best fire suits in any form of racing you know any any form of racing you know the gloves and everything you know the, the nomex you know you put so much stuff on but you know that it will save your life yeah. and whatever the cost you know if it saves someone's life it's it, it's nothing it's you know whatever you spend if it's a million pounds your life is well, yeah. mine is worth more than that. I mean, <laughs> well, Jason obviously does. Jason came back last <laughs> year when she drove. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jason came back last year to top fuel after 14 years out of it. Uh, you, Gary, are very aware she drove Canute's car. And I can remember at one point you even had blocks of wood on, on the throttle throttle plate so that she could actually reach it. And, and they all did strange things. And they were fire proofs, though, Keith. Yeah, <laughs> the one interesting with Suzanne coming back after all those years, whereas at 18, safety didn't worry her too much and she had quite a big crash in a, a super comp car. She took it all in a stride. At 36 years of age, guess what? The first thing she looked at last year was the best fire suit. She wants the best safety, the best everything. Uh, I was there when you were buying it, Keith, and you were shaking at the price, mate. Uh, well, when you got went away, I actually had to cut a deal. <laughs> my boy. Um, a, bit, a bit like a fashion show outside the Simpson trailer, that Gary. It was, it was. I it walked around there and he went, oh, my God, she wants this now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was funny. I remember she did. She went yeah. for it. And then it didn't fit. You know, she had to go through. <laughs> yeah, when they made it, yeah. it was like, they, they measured it. And it was like, who the hell did they measure that for? It was just. 
they were like was, riding jumpers. She came out. Uh, honestly, she was going yeah. Down by the horse. I just want to drop back on the on on the guys listening to everything. You must have something on your mind, both of you. You'd like to ask them. No, I'm just sitting here enjoying this chat. It's brilliant. You know what? I, I, I'm totally with Luke on this. This is this is gold. This episode. So, Jason, you've most probably raced at so many tracks all over Europe and maybe even America. I don't know, but um, one thing that stands out in my mind is a photo that I've seen, and it's something that not many people have done, and that is burnouts at Goodwood. How did that come around, and how did that get received? Well, to be, it was uh, it came through Santa Pod through Robin. Uh, I've done it twice, and the first time was with uh, Shockwave with the Yellow Marshall car. Uh, so then the first time I got, I, I went in in there, and I had Dave with me, and we, I sat on their start line in between the trees, and all of a sudden it looked really narrow, really narrow. And uh, when I stood on it, and uh, Gary will tell you, a funny car will always make one move at the top. So what happens is you hit the bottle, it jump up on its tires. And a car, most cars, every time they'll they'll go one way, they'll go the other way, and and you just hold them. But when you're dealing with like a, I don't know how wide it was, probably fifteen foot maybe across That's with a cam, a camber on it as well, like a real camber. You could see it, and I was thinking, what if it falls off the edge here? And they got, they had these huge like hay bales, like I've never seen the size of before, and. Um, I, I presume it's probably doing about 50, 60 mile per hour, and all of a sudden it got really, really narrow. But it was like being in the middle of Gran Turismo. That's what I thought. There was cars that I'd never seen unless they were on a PlayStation. Do you understand what I mean? It was just a wonderful experience. The second time when I w was asked to go back, uh, the car was all in bits. It was, uh, I'd ended, I'd basically called it, and I, I didn't have the money to carry on, and the car was spread out in in different places carl harrison had the chassis and the motor and uh it was just a bit all of a bit of a jumble i got a phone call they said would you come back to um uh to goodwood and i was like oh yeah okay then so basically i've got a car in an old sponsorship colors it's all over the place it was a like herculean effort to put the thing back together and i sat there and i thought to myself and i was trying to come up with a paint job and I was looking through the internet, looking for, and I was sitting in the front of the, uh, actually over at the track, I was sitting in the front of a van and we were driving up to Runa's and someone said something about Gladiator and then I, and it, all of a sudden it was like this epiphany, this burning light, why don't you make a Gladiator? And that is how actual Gladiator came about. The second time at Goodwood, um, it was hell. It was raining. I can remember standing on the trailer because we went down in the Santa Pod trailer and they parked it on this grass and it was like about 15 foot between the trackway and the trailer and it was just a mud field. And, we were just, and it was my birthday and I was sitting on the back of the trailer on the phone going, I can't get the car out of the trailer. Ah, 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 where's David Warren? Ah, 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 like this. And as I'm shouting, the rain's coming down sideways. It was a living hell, right? What you saw, you know that video that they put out where I do like about four or five further, pure anger. It was anger and frustration. <laughs> I'd been there for four days. I was soaking wet. I'd wrecked a pair of trainers, which really annoyed me. And the, um, the whole deal was just horrible. But the video, it blew away everything that we could do. And it is one of my proudest things. I, you know, the, the bottom line is I've cornered the market in driving funny cars around car parks. You know. Remember, Jason, I, the important thing there is the car parks aren't not going to 60 foot. So you probably... Yeah, 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 yeah. I can make it. They're narrower, though. I was Sorry. there. I was at Goodwood Festival of Speed when you did that. I heard the car fire up. I was stand MC for Vauxhall doing uh, some voice work down there. I legged it across the field. I just managed to catch the first stage of the burnout. We're going up the drive. And honestly, people's reaction, they've never seen yeah, a fuel true. motor, never heard a fuel car before. They were effing and jeffing all over the place thinking, oh my God, what was that? But Jace, it was the coolest thing I have ever seen a funny car, do, a drag racing vehicle do outside of a drag strip. It was brilliant. Yeah, it was fun. You know, every car story is funny now, but at the time it was a living hell to be honest with you. Until that last run where they put me out, and I, they, they said it's the last run of the day, and I thought, right, I'm going to have this. And that last one, as it goes, as you're going towards the tire, I think, yeah. 
the car was filling up like a 70s burnout with smoke because I tried to let some out the top because it was already full of smoke. And I looked at the tyre and I thought to myself, right, this that bit. And I lifted the hatch a little bit, put it down, and I double stepped it, I went back up like that, and then let it go. And I was watching my trajectory. And I was thinking, if you don't get off this soon, you're going to. This is going to be a completely different story. But um, yeah, I just about caught it. But you know, at the end of that, I've got one of the tyres in the back garden here, through to canvas. We were, but we were probably as another second away to losing the tyre. There was a McLaren bigwig come past, and he looked inside the car, and uh, he looked at me, and I went, "Push rods, it's the future." And it, <laughs> <laughs> and he, he, he laughed at me and said that was amazing and then he responded off. I don't actually know who it was, but he was a big one. The other memory from Goodwood, Jace, I think you can remember this one as well. Um, I think it was you doing your morning warm-up just as the television station was going live yeah. for a news feed. Yeah. Tell us about that. That was brilliant. Oh, man. He, Vince Cable was doing a live television feed about 25 yards away from us in the press tent. And we had started the funny car up and hit the throttles <laughs> on television. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So that was it. Yeah, good wood, I think, was good for all of us, really. Yeah, uh, and, yeah. yeah, yeah and uh, yeah, I'm glad that I was in work on I'm glad I was involved. I'm really happy. I'd love to have another go, to be honest with you, but I don't know what I'd do. Probably crash. You'd have to go a heck of a long way to beat those. That's it. I've it's actually good. wondered if I could get it to the top. Drive up the hill. Actually, yeah. I have much left. Because they do turn. You can throw them about a bit. It's just like driving a big tractor. Yeah. Like a has got a big brake. And you know it's, I mean? a, it's a 10,000 horsepower go-kart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, all, it gets a bit excited when you touch the throttle. But other than that, it's okay. Yeah. Now, it's one of the questions that we ask every week to all of our guests. Uh, what would you be doing if you weren't drag racing? Now, this is quite a hard one because, uh, as we've learned in the show, Jason, you've basically lived at Santa Pod for a majority of your life. And Gary Page, it's taken up over 50 years of your life. But, Gary, let's start off with you. Um, <coughs> if you drag racing, what would you do? Um, yeah, good point. Uh, I mean, I enjoy playing golf. Uh, you know, when I was at school, I was really good at athletics. Uh, you know, sort of did some running for Middlesex and I played rugby and stuff. And, uh, it became a, a, a toss up. I, I couldn't spare the time to do both. And then I started, you know, going drag racing, which I really enjoy. It's been such a big part of my life. I can't ever think of, you know, of not doing drag racing, you know, and, uh, you know, maybe I'd like to think that, you know, I'll be doing something like that, you know, carried on with the athletics because I was reasonably good, but, you know, I'm happy where I am, you know, I've, yeah. uh, I, it just I, I love what the I'm same doing. kind of lifestyle with drag racing. The amount of people that you meet from different countries, oh God, yeah. different lifestyles that you learn just from visiting different tracks. I think that's oh, the yeah. best thing about drag racing. It's that is the you know uh, that is the one thing you know. I love the racing and you know just being down on the start line. You know, it, it's just everyone should really try it at some stage because you know when you're on the bank or in the grandstands, it's one thing, but when you're on the start line, it's just, as you know, Luke, it's just, you know, when they had that guy come over did the 13, 20 thing the other year, you know, the American, he was just blown away, you know, and it is, it's just totally different down on the start line. And I know how they work. I know how they do what they do, but it's still, I go, it just, my jaw drops every time because what they physically do is just unbelievable. And I still feel that, you know, I still get such a buzz out of it that's why i'm still doing it if i didn't get that buzz i, I wouldn't bother yeah. oh is that a gap in there that is the perfect opportunity to a santa pod competition how many times did gary page say you know oh god <laughs> I, oh, I we've, got, we've got it I, I don't know, oh, like, it like, looking at me while he's talking but i'm like 10 11 12 25 <laughs> 45 50 it has been mentioned a few times that I, you, know. you know you know you know and to you, Jason, obviously you said your granddad has paid £10 for Santa Pod. If that hadn't have happened and your life was completely different, what would you be doing without drag racing? I wanted to be a hairdresser. <laughs> no, I'm, jo I'm, not, well, I'm not joking. And that's what I actually tried to become a hairdresser when I'd had one of my dad had sacked me. He used to sack me with amazing regularity. And uh, 
Uh, one time I stormed off and I was going to go and get an apprenticeship as a, a hairdresser and that's what I would have been doing with hair. Teasy Weezy Phelps. Yep, yep, that's yeah. what I would have been doing. Looking at, you, looking at you today, <laughs> Jason, just looking at you, you are on our show today, you you just wouldn't, well, you didn't make it, that's obvious. Well, just, I did, well no, I didn't. I ended up as a, I ended up here. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But that, no, you asked a good question. I told you the answer. I, I so we're both... To, we both failed hairdressers, then, Jace. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. Pretty <laughs> much. If I wasn't, if I wasn't here, I'd, um, I'd uh, probably be down in Cornwall, sitting on a beach. There you go. That's what I'll be doing. That's what I've done in my time away from the sport. And uh, I come back because I had uh, some unfinished business. I'm sort of getting there. I'm probably, I'm probably one or two runs away from being where I really need to be. And then, uh, and then maybe I'll be back on the beach in Cornwall. Who knows? Who knows? We're glad you did. Yeah. Pass me number on to Jackie if uh, you know if, if you're yeah. gonna bin it. Yeah. You've been I, mean, it I, I ain't going nowhere before they retire. <laughs> <laughs> they're moving up to they're moving up to yeah. Like, yeah. over on the coast, then are you? I've made the we'll living out there. of driving cars that Gary was meant to drive because I, I bought my moves, didn't I? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I had that one. So basically I felt a bit guilty with Gary. Nah, um, you know, honestly, you know, Mark and Jackie. Uh, it was so difficult, you know, just branching off the subject. You know, I mean, it was, I was so involved with, you know, w- with working on the cars and stuff. It was, it was such a big tear, you know, I, I really, I really enjoyed joining the car, but, you know, it was so strange seeing the car, you know, the drags are run without me being there and stuff. Yeah. And like when Mark and Jackie, they, they, it's no, you know, there's no odd feeling between me and Jason and Mark and Jackie and stuff, you know, we're still really good friends and, is they wanted to go in a different direction and you know it was like the direction they wanted to go was having Jason in the car which is absolutely fine you know it's like you know and it, I just yeah you know, I just stepped back into getting covered in clutch crap <laughs> I, I, you do I, that very I, well I, I knew who I looked up to when I was a kid uh probably quite a few people because you're not that tall no nah, it was you oh yeah, sorry it was you my friend oh, so, when I when Jason. I was growing up when I was sort of like in my early my sort of like in my later teens it was Gary that I, uh, I he was my favourite. Uh, although he came from the other side, and I was it's only because I bought like your beer it. in Holland. <laughs> it's great, yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, he went yeah. it. Uh, Bribe him. Yeah, God's honest truth. Gary was, and I, and I know it seems a bit weird because we're together, but the uh, bottom line is Gary was the person I looked up to. I thought he was one of the nicest people around the sport, and uh, I, if I could have emulated him, I would have loved to have been. Able to. Thank you, Jason. Never, no. No, it means it, a lot, it, mate. It, it's absolutely true, Gary. I can't say enough. It means a lot, mate. Thank you. Gary, who are your idols? You must have some idols. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, I don't know whether I can just do this quickly. If I just take this, I just want to show you some of the pictures that I put up, yeah? What you were talking about earlier. Let me, let me just take you around here. And, uh, you know, some of the pictures on the wall, you know, I mean, you know, Jim and Graham Hawes. I mean, Jim Reed, I looked up to. Fantastic. You know, these are just some of the cars that I've driven. And of course, you know, Bootsy and Gladiator, you know, driving, you know, Rico's car, you know, the two seater, you know, my brother. And these are all the trophies with my Sumi hat and, the, you know, what oh, Keith gave me. Obviously, you know, Beadle, you know, Harlan Thompson when we used to race Harlan. You know, everyone used to think we hated each other. We'd be in the trailer chatting, you know, and it was all a big, you know, Harlan said, you got to keep it going, you know, the competition and stuff. Me and Harlan are really good friends. You know, when I go out to America and he's at the racetrack, always get invited to whatever pit he's in, you know, and all these people, you know, and it's, you know, it's like, you know, Runa. I mean, you know, I know I work for him, but, you know, and he, he just, he's just... He's such a nice guy. Well, as we know, we could talk to our guests for absolutely ever and make a complete series about them. But uh, you know what, Keith, it's time for mug off time. I have got mugs here, but the one I wanted to, to actually use is uh, up at the track. I was up at the track in the week and I left it there. So I think graciously I'm going to step aside rather than bring out one of the others. So I might start with Jason. Jason, show us your mug for the mug off. Oh, I'm going to go with this one. The reason is, right, it was after the finals. I went, I took my little girl to Disneyland Paris, right, and I and the one thing, souvenir I bought myself was a mug. And they all thought it was because I've been to Disneyland, but in fact, it's actually a Miller tri- tribute, a Sammy Miller tribute. 
because he always wore that T-shirt, and that's why I always think about when I look at the mum. There you go. Cool. And Gary, over to you. What was your mug off? Well, this is somebody. Somebody got me this. Dave, who does the clutch on the car, he. I went up to see him one weekend, and he gave me this. And it's a mug I always use at home. So it's a nice, nice old panic mug. So yeah, that's it. nice, nice. There you go. Colin, you must have some mug somewhere. Uh, yeah, I've got one this week, um, and this is a support mug for an organisation that have always been uh, sort of following the sport quite closely. And of course, it is the NSRA, National Street Rod Association. Oh, yeah. yeah, cool. Um, been uh, quite pivotal in the sport over the years, and uh, a big shout out to you guys. Back to our studio, and Luke, what have you uh, got for us this week? Everyone's so sensible. It was uh, Father's Day last week, so uh, mm. it's a unicorn. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got, we, uh, I've got uh, two of those. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, as much as I love both Gary's and uh, Jason's because of the uh, the resultant history that's going around in both those cups, Luke, you've actually put a bit of thought into it, son, and you are the winner of Mug Off this week. <laughs> yes. Beaten by unicorn. Beaten by unicorn. <laughs> My daughter would approve. Just before I go. Thank you to both of you. But for those of you at home, on the back of a postcard, don't forget how many times did Gary Page say, you know. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, it's been yeah, no. uh, a brilliant Friday night. And the guests tonight, you, you two were absolutely amazing. See, amazing is my word, Gary. You say, you know, I say amazing. Oh, no. I'll get, I'll get amazing. amazing. Oh, I'm going to get but, so much ribbing for that from my wife. That's it. Well, all good shows have to come to an end, and this Friday night show has been an absolutely amazing show. But if you're new to us, the Santa Podcast, hit that subscribe button, leave in the comments who you want to see next week or in further weeks. But for now, to our two guests, thank you very much, Gary and Jason. Hope you had a wonderful evening. Uh, it's been an absolute, honestly, it, it's been such a pleasure. You know, when Keith said about it, ah. Uh, it's been, you know, time's flown, absolutely flown. It's been wonderful speaking to you and Colin and Keith and Jason as well. You know, it's just been, it's just been nice, you know, going over some old memories and stuff and just, you know, chatting to friends. You know, it's good. You can't spend yeah. a Friday night any better. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, again, I'll just repeat that. Really thank you for letting me be involved and having, uh, yeah, it's been nice. It's been nice seeing everyone. It's nice to be part of it. Yeah. And hopefully we'll all be back soon. Luke, it's been an absolute fast night. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. It is. The, the, the last six weeks have been brilliant. We've got to know some ins and outs of races from all over Europe. And I look forward to getting back to next season and learning more about of our races that come to Santa Pod Raceway. Yeah. Well, there you go, Luke. That goes to show. It's actually seven, but you lost count, mate. But, <laughs> <laughs> but um, Keith, I know you want to make a final announcement. So... Uh... That's yeah, right. we, um, we will be going back to our back on track day start July the 4th. The plan is to run two of those events in July and two run what you brungs. Uh, as for this show, we are actually making this the last one of this season with guests. Next week's show will probably involve Luke, myself and Colin just looking at a summary of what we've done in this first season of these shows, some of the highlights and a bit of a chat among ourselves about where we're going. But the good news is the shows aren't going away. They're going to come back in another format during racing. We'll have our studio where Luke sits now. That will have guests in there. So the shows are going to continue, but the next season of six or eight shows will probably have a slightly different format to this. You know, we've got a lot to look forward to. And uh, yeah, let's see where we go from here. Uh, to close in my usual thing, see you at the track. I can't yeah. wait. So the studio is going to get bigger. We're going to get that settee out. And uh, oh, hopefully we'll get Daryl up there as well, I reckon, Lou. That's going to be great, eh? Oh, we won't get a word in air trays. <laughs> well, uh, all I can say is just roll on July. Let's look forward to our slick tyre racing weekend and, of course, our uh, street tyre track day as well. It's going to be fantastic. So really look forward to next week's show where Luke, Keith and myself will be uh, looking at some of the coverage we've had with our guests. You never know, you might see a few outtakes as well. Goodness help us. <laughs> but yeah, it's going to be good. And it'll be the last mug off as well. So let's hope that the three of us can bring something pretty special to the party. Uh, Luke, been a great show, hasn't it, mate? Absolutely brilliant. Been amazing. A good, fun seven weeks. 
I can't wait to get back to racing. See you next week. Yeah, we'll take it steady, everybody. We'll see you soon. We'll see you back on track. Bye. Bye-bye. That's hands.